What's up guys? Today we're going to talk about esophageal foreign body ingestions and esophageal food boluses, also known as impactions. We're going to talk about how these patients will present, what risk factors to look out for, the most common causes, treatment, and how do we manage these patients. Esophageal food boluses, also known as impactions, can be defined when food gets stuck in the esophagus causing an obstruction, which can either be partial or complete, whereas an esophageal foreign body ingestion can be defined by any object originating outside the human body that's ingested. Accidental esophageal foreign body and large foreign body ingestions primarily occur in children or mentally impaired adults. The most common foreign body ingestions in children are coins such as pennies, nickels, or quarters, and other common ingestions in children include button batteries, sharp objects such as needles, straightened paper clips, and fish bones, food impactions such as meat, but these are really actually going to be rare in children, magnets commonly found in toys, and long objects such as toothbrushes, spoons, or batteries superabsorbent polymers, objects containing lead such as fishing sinkers, BB gun pellets, and even some toys. However, esophageal foreign body impactions once again more commonly occur in adults. The most common foods causing impaction include meat, fish, and chicken bones. But what causes these obstructions? Briefly, let's talk about some anatomy of the esophagus because foreign body impactions typically occur at sites of physiologic or pathologic narrowing. The esophagus has three areas of physiologic narrowing the upper esophageal sphincter, the level of the aortic arch, and the diaphragmatic hiatus. Structural or functional esophageal abnormalities that increase the risk of impaction most commonly are going to be secondary to an esophageal stricture or ring causing the foreign body to get stuck just above the lesion. Other common causes include esophageal tumors, achalasia, esophageal webs, diverticula, hiatal hernias, and eosinophilic esophagitis. So now we know what risk factors to look out for and the most common foreign bodies ingested in children and adults, but how would these patients present? Well, before you enter the room, as always, take a look at the triage note and review the vital signs. Non-impaired adults and older children with an impacted food bolus will typically tell you what they ingested and point to a specific area of discomfort. Commonly, they will tell you that they just ate a piece of meat and feel like it's stuck in their throat. They will also be complaining of acute onset dysphagia 92% of the time and neck tenderness about 60% of the time. They might complain of vomiting with an inability to keep down solids or liquids, choking, retrosternal fullness, regurgitation of undigested food, wheezing, painful swallowing, which could indicate an esophageal laceration or maybe even a perforation, and some patients may even present with signs of small bowel obstruction, such as abdominal pain and distension. However, children with esophageal foreign bodies are going to present a little bit differently. This is because most ingestions in children occur between the ages of 6 months and 3 years, and they can't always tell you what's wrong. They may be completely asymptomatic with reports by the caregiver of a witnessed ingestion of some type of object. Or when they have symptoms, the parents might tell you they are refusing to eat, vomiting, choking when eating, drooling, or even wheezing on physical exam, and really as soon as you enter the room, you need to note the general appearance of the patient. Remember the ABCs of emergency medicine. Make sure the patient is protecting their airway, breathing appropriately, talking in full sentences without any strider or wheezing, and quickly assess their circulation via capillary refill and skin turgor, making sure they're not severely dehydrated secondary to vomiting. Note the temperature of their extremities, making sure they're not cool and cyanotic as well. On physical exam, these patients will oftentimes be sitting up slightly leaning forward, drooling, and constantly spitting up their secretions into an emesis basin, or they might even brought their own cup with them and spitting into that. An inability to swallow their own secretions is an important symptom that indicates a complete obstruction. I'll say that again. If they cannot swallow their own secretions, they're leaning forward, they're drooling, this means they have a complete esophageal obstruction. Look in the back of their throat for any obvious evidence of a retained foreign body, such as dentures, in the older individual. Note the appearance of the posterior pharynx. Is it erythematous from excessive vomiting? Are there pieces of partially digested food? And make sure that the uvula is midline and that there is no peritonsillar abscess present. Also, you want to note the appearance of the dentition. Do they have multiple dental caries and rotted teeth? in the setting of facial or submandibular swelling that could indicate a buccal space abscess of the cause of their dysphagia and vomiting. In addition, in the child, it's not uncommon for them to come in with complaints of throat pain and vomiting with eating. Make sure to note the tonsils, making sure they are normal size as well because children with tonsillar adenoid hypertrophy can have extremely big, non-exudative tonsils that are kissing, and every time the food passes by them, it triggers the gag reflex. Next, take a look at the neck, noting any tenderness. If they reportedly swallowed a sharp object, such as a chicken bone, we need to make sure there's no concomitant perforation. Look at the neck for swelling, tenderness, erythema, and palpate for crepitus that could indicate perforation in the oropharynx or proximal esophagus. 
then palpate their chest, making sure they don't have any sternal crepitus, which could indicate a perforation in the mid or distal esophagus. You want to palpate their chest to see if you can reproduce any pain, which might give you a clue to the level of the obstruction. Next, do a good abdominal exam, making sure they don't have any signs of peritonitis, such as rebound tenderness, guarding, or a rigid abdomen that could indicate a stomach perforation, maybe from an ingested battery. Listen to their lungs, making sure there's no abnormal sounds, such as strider, wheezing, crackles, or gargling sounds. Here, you're going to want to listen to the anterior chest wall and the posterior superior lungs, since most aspirations occur in the top portions of the lungs, making sure they don't have any crackles, wheezing, gargling noises that could indicate aspiration of food contents, and make sure they're not coughing up any really foul-smelling purulent sputum that could indicate an aspiration as well. Next, complete their exam listening to their heart, making sure they don't have any concomitant heart irregularities that could complicate their management. Now, after you've done a good physical exam, let's talk about what imaging studies we can order to confirm the diagnosis. Since many foreign body ingestions and impactions can be detected using plain films, x-rays are going to be our initial imaging study of choice. However, even in adults that can tell you exactly where their pain is, studies show that this does not always correlate with the level of obstruction of the foreign body. So with that said, if you have a patient who's complaining of pain and trouble swallowing in the neck, you'll want to order a neck x-ray with an AP and lateral view as well as the chest to localize the foreign body. However, keep in mind that many objects cannot be seen on plain films, such as impacted food boluses from fish or meat. Other objects that won't be seen include fish bones, chicken bones, wood, plastic, and glass. So the absence of not identifying these objects with a known history of ingestion does not rule out their presence. In the very small child, you have the option of ordering one film with them standing up from nose to rectum. However, this will only give you one AP view of the neck, chest, and abdomen. So a better option would be AP and lateral x-rays of the neck, chest, and abdomen. Furthermore, even if the foreign body ingested is reportedly radiolucent and it's not expected to show up on x-ray, plain films should still be done in children. This is to evaluate for the possibility of other swallowed objects because children will eat anything that looks good to them. And we also want to look for any indirect evidence of a radiolucent chicken bone such as air fluid level in the esophagus or free air representing a perforation. Flat objects such as coins typically get stuck in the coronal plane and are best seen on the AP view. Tracheal foreign bodies will align in the sagittal plane and are best seen on the lateral view. Disc batteries can be hard to differentiate from coins but there will be subtle differences, and if you fail to differentiate the two, there can be dire consequences. This is because you will soon learn the management is different for the two, and if you mistake a disc battery for a coin and don't remove it emergently, the patient will suffer esophageal erosions and ultimately perforate. So if you have a patient with a circular foreign body, you must look extremely closely, making sure it's not a disc battery. Disc batteries, which you can see on the left, will have a double ring or halo appearance, while as the coin will not. CT scanning may be done if films are negative, particularly in patients suspected of having ingested packets of narcotics or other drugs. Or let's say the study is negative, but you suspect a perforation from a sharp object, such as a chicken bone, then you really need to get a CT of the neck and chest to rule this out if there was no evidence on the x-ray and suspicion is still high. However, if the patient is still having persistent symptoms and the likeliness of perforation is low, an upper endoscopy might be your better option here. So now that we know how these patients will present, what risk factors predispose them, and how to diagnose, how do we treat these patients? Well, in the adult with an impacted food bolus, unable to tolerate his own secretions with a history of dysphagia and a feeling of fullness in his throat, who, let's say, hasn't been able to eat or drink anything in one to two days after you've identified the foreign body or lack of, you want to gain IV access. You want to order some basic labs to include a CBC and CMP looking for any electrolyte abnormalities second to vomiting or anemia in the setting of a long history of GERD, obesity, and trouble swallowing that could indicate an esophageal cancer causing the obstruction. If they're dehydrated, bolus them with one liter normal saline or lactated ringers and treat their symptoms of nausea with either Zofran or Finnegan. Now pay close attention because everything we've done up until now is just consisted of symptomatic treatment. However, in the adult with a suspected food bolus, a trial of one milligram IV glucagon, I'll say that again, a trial of one milligram IV glucagon can be given in an attempt to relax the esophagus, which may promote passage of the food bolus. Wait about 30 minutes to see if the impacted food bolus passes, and if not, in the patient that's still actively unable to tolerate their own secretions, they will need an emergent upper endoscopy. So in my typical practice, at this point, I call my general surgeon because at my institution, we do not have gastroenterology coverage, and I tell them that I have a patient with an impacted food bolus that was unable to be identified on plain films, but suspected to be meat. He is unable to tolerate his own secretions, 
and has not been able to keep down liquids or solids for over a day, and despite a trial of 1 mg glucagon IV, still remains impacted. Make sure to convey that there's no evidence of perforation on imaging studies and exam. From here, I typically order an EKG because I know they will want that before they take the patient for disimpaction via upper endoscopy. However, what do you do for the patient who reports passage of their food bolus with glucagon? Well, in these patients, you want to make sure they are tolerating their own secretions, monitor them in the ED for another 30 minutes, and before they leave, you need to give them a PO challenge, making sure they can keep down liquids. Once they pass this test, document in your chart and refer them to gastroenterology or general surgery because they will most likely need an upper endoscopy to rule out any underlying pathology or they might even need an esophageal dilation. In addition, although rare, if a child presents with the same symptoms secondary to an impacted food bolus, glucagon should not be given. This is because it causes more nausea and vomiting and the efficacy is lacking. These patients with a complete obstruction should be treated with an emergent upper endoscopy. But how do we treat the child with a foreign body ingestion? Well, this is really going to depend on the location of the foreign body and the object ingested. Urgent intervention in children is indicated via upper endoscopy or other technique if the ingested object is sharp, longer than 5 centimeters, or a super absorbent polymer in the distal esophagus or stomach. This is because sharp objects increase the risk of perforation and long objects typically greater than 5 to 6 centimeters cannot pass through the stomach or if they do, they're going to become stuck in the ileocecal region. In addition, superabsorbent polymers can expand up to 30 to 60 times their original size when hydrated, which can cause bowel obstruction and should be removed immediately before it can travel to the intestines. Urgent intervention in children is also needed if the object is a high-powered magnet or magnets. This is because they pose a serious risk for GI perforation. In general, the more magnets ingested, the greater risk for complications. This is because magnets have the potential to attract each other across different layers of bowels, leading to pressure necrosis, fistulas, perforations, infections, and even obstruction. If multiple magnets are not removed in a timely manner, an intestinal resection may be necessary, depending on the damage done. However, if only one magnet is ingested, you have the option of removing it if it's accessible in the esophagus or stomach, or managing it conservatively. Just make sure while you are treating the patient, you have them remove any metal the magnet could get stuck to, such as a belt buckle, belly button ring, or metal necklace. If you choose to monitor these patients, they should be asymptomatic and serial radiographs can be performed every four to six hours. You can consider administering polyethylene glycol without electrolytes or Miralax to expedite the progression of the object through the GI tract, but this decision should really be made up to the inpatient team. Urgent intervention is also necessary if the child has ingested a button battery and it's lodged in the esophagus. This is because ulceration can occur in a few hours after ingestion and perforation as soon as eight hours after ingestion. Furthermore, if the child has ingested any object and is showing sign of airway compromise, they will need an emergent removal. However, let's quickly talk about the child who ingests a foreign body and does not need an emergent removal. If the child decides a quarter, nickel, dime, or penny looks delicious and ends up getting it stuck in their esophagus, and the patient is having no symptoms, the child can be observed for 24 hours. This is because about 20 to 30 percent of coins will pass into the stomach on their own, and it is even more likely to pass if it's lodged in the distal third of the esophagus. If at any time during the monitoring the patient becomes symptomatic or the time of ingestion is not known, it should be removed immediately. In addition, if after 24 hours of monitoring the coin does not pass into the stomach, it should also be removed. If, however, the coin reaches the stomach, it can continue to be managed expectedly because coins lack sharp edges and the metal is non-toxic. Most of these coins will pass within one to two weeks. X-rays should be repeated about once a week in the asymptomatic child. If the coin has not passed into the intestines by four weeks, endoscopic removal is needed. In addition, if at any time the child becomes symptomatic with signs and symptoms of obstruction, abdominal pain, vomiting, and fever, Repeat plain films are emergently done, and the coin is emergently removed. So that's everything we're going to talk about today. Remember, children read anything that looks good, and I'm curious, what's the weirdest foreign body ingestion you've ever seen? You can go ahead and comment below. I personally just managed a five-year-old child who swallowed a yellow thumbtack. She told me that yellow foods were her favorite, so she thought it would probably be good. If you have any questions, as always, please email me at gray at physicianassistantboards.com. That's G-R-A-Y at physicianassistantboards.com. Until next time.